Welcome to Secret Life Gardens. I'm Lydia Bissler. Now, I wanted to start off this month, the month of February, talking about the seasonal shift that it represents. It's the crossover from the hibernative Persephone period into having more than 10 hours of sunlight a day, the halfway stop in between the winter solstice and the spring equinox. But like most of the continent, we got hit with a massive ice storm in the past week. Inches of ice covered the yard, like most of the state. This is the effect of climate change, which is causing the jet stream to wobble. A massive swath of Arctic air shot down and coated most of North America. As of today, February 20th, about 300,000 people in the U.S. are still without power. Now, what does that mean for the garden? There are many strategies when considering your entire environment is a part of your resilience plan towards climate change. If you're like me and you want to be prepared for potential natural disasters, growing and storing your own food could be a lifesaver. Consider growing a little extra for a neighbor too. Plant more native plants. They're already adapted to your climate. Here we have rainy and mild winters, but hot and super dry summers. So our native plants need less extra pampering over the summer. Then consider the streams, which are becoming all more common with climate change. Keep fleece on hand to protect tender plants in case of cold snaps. If you do get snow, leave it on your plants so it acts as an insulator. If it's going to be cold and dry, water your plants to protect them more. Save your rainwater. Not only can you drink it, of course, after treating it in case of a natural disaster, you can also use it during drier periods to water your plants and keep them healthy. If you live in a fire risk area, carefully consider what plants you're planting near your house. Certain plants like eucalyptus, for example, are oil laden and actually invasive in places like California. These plants should never be planted near your house. That being said, as much as I want to think that I can fight climate change myself, we truly need the action of the federal government to make change. This is a large and complex intersectional issue that will affect people that do not look like me more than myself. Rugged individualism only places the burden on the most vulnerable. It is time to demand change, to vote, to call your representatives, to march in the streets. This is only the beginning. Now, I did want to show you images of our Pieris stratica. Three of these shrubs came with the house. Usually around Valentine's Day, there's one particularly large shrub that is just laden with beautiful tiny strings of pink, perfect little flowers. With the ice storm, all the flowers froze and fell off. Plus, our front yard is a little bit messy right now. A lot of limbs came down in the ice storm, so we're chopping them up. Instead, let's talk about cutting back deciduous grasses. This is a great time of year to cut back your deciduous grasses, such as this miscanthus. Just cut it right back to where all the new growth will come up, and then take all of the stuff from the previous year and throw it on your compost pile. It's a great source of carbon, and miscanthus and other big grasses like this are also a great fast-growing source of biomass for your garden. On a bigger plant, such as this one, it can be helpful to tie up the old stalks before you cut it and everything goes everywhere. Once that's set, just cut them back to the ground hard. While you can do this in fall, I prefer to wait until late winter. The dried grasses provide seasonal interest, plus birds eat from the seed heads all winter when other food sources are low. Evergreen grasses or sedges do not need to be cut back. Instead, you can kind of comb them. 
Just run your gloved hand through the plant to remove any old foliage. Semi evergreens can have their old seed heads cut down flush with the rest of the plant. And then the same as evergreen ones, run your gloved hands through them. On another note, the soil is still a bit cold and wet, at least here, to divide or plant new grasses or sedges. But it's good to cut things back before too much growth starts. There's lots of little pruning jobs to be done in February here. While I take care of all my trees earlier in the season, February is a great time to prune a lot of shrubs. This includes my roses, which I grow in our cut flower garden at our allotment space. At our allotment, we have three varieties of roses. Our Coco Loco, which starts off a creamy latte and finishes in a light lavender. It's a floribunda. We have a second floribunda as well, Earth Angel. It has soft pink peony shaped flowers with a delicious fragrance. And our shrub rose, Tequila Sunrise. Its flowers are a coppery pink color and have a unique scalloped edge. Like any plant that you're pruning, you'll want to first go through and remove any dead, damaged, or crossing branches. Once you've done that, go ahead and cut out any thin growth, so, so anything thinner than a pencil, as well as growth coming towards the center of the plant. If you have an older, more established plant, go ahead and remove a few of the older branches. Green growth is going to produce more flowers than your older brown colored stems. Once you're done with that, cut everything down to about 12 to 18 inches. You'll want to make your cut just above a bud. You're basically looking for an open bowl shape of stubby branches. Some people prune their shrub roses in late fall, but in Portland, it's actually recommended to prune them in late February. Plus the rose hips actually make a great food source for wildlife all winter long. I waited a little bit to prune these since I knew a hard frost was coming and I didn't want the new growth that would be stimulated by pruning to get severely damaged during a hard frost. Once I prune these, I'll also prune some woody salvias and some Arrhenia saxatillus in the backyard garden. February isn't just pruning and waiting for growth to emerge though. There's also a real chance to encourage wildlife in your own backyard. There are an estimated 500 plus species of bees in the state of Oregon. That's a huge number that reflects the rich biodiversity of our state. In fact, the Pacific Northwest has more species of bees than all the states east of the Mississippi combined. That does not mean that Oregon does not face the same issues that the rest of the world does. We do have a declining pollinator population, but luckily us gardeners can help plant native plants in your garden and don't forget native flowering trees. Try to have as long of a continuous flowering period as possible in your garden. Plus year-round interest is fun for us gardeners too. Plant single flower, single petaled flowers as much as possible. Multi-petaled or double petaled flowers make it difficult if not impossible for bees to actually reach the nectar in the center of the flower. Also be a little messy in your garden. Leave some piles of sticks. Leave the leaves in the fall. This provides great nesting habitat for many insects. Go organic if you are not already. If you are unwilling to go organic for some reason, try to at least avoid using insecticides and herbicides during the flowering period for bee attractant plants. If you'd like to take your beekeeping skills to the next level, build yourself a nesting box like this one here. This is a nesting box for solitary bees. Solitary bees actually make up 90% of all bee species. A solitary bee is a bee that does not swarm, it does not build hives, 
and it does not make honey. With no honey to defend, they're particularly gentle. And if they do happen to sting you for some reason, their stingers actually do not contain venom like the way that a honeybee does. Plus, solitary bees are actually superior pollinators. They can pollinate as much as a hundred honeybees. Mason bees are one of four types of managed bees in the state of Oregon. Of those four, they're one of two species of native bees. They're also a solitary bee species. If you're building a box for them like this, they prefer eight millimeter sized holes. You'll also wanna orient the box towards the southeast or maybe the south as they like to receive the early morning sun. So all spring they'll build cocoons which they'll hibernate in over the winter. And then in the spring they'll emerge once daytime temperatures reach about 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Mason bees will actually double or triple the amount of harvest that you'll get as well. This year, I actually purchased some mason bee cocoons through local beekeepers through a company called Crown Bees. Since our plum trees in the front are getting ready to bloom and our temperatures are finally warming up after that cold snap, I'll actually release them here in about a week. So in a week, I'll take some of these cocoons and I'll place them on the ledge up on top of the nesting box especially once temperatures start to get towards 50 degrees during the day, although it's also okay if it's still a little bit cold at night. When I release them, I'm gonna look for a variety of cocoon sizes. The larger cocoons are female and the smaller cocoons are male. I'll also release in a couple stages. So in a week, I'll put about half of them out here on top of the nesting box. And then in another couple weeks from then, I'll release the rest of them. In that time in the interim, I'll just store them in the fridge so they stay in their hibernative state. I cannot wait, once the weather warms up and spring is here a little bit more, to watch the mason bees go back and forth from the plum trees to their nest in the back. Well, that's it for February. There's a few more jobs that'll take care of, such as planting pea seeds, getting more starts going in the basement and potting things up. With the snow melting, there's a really strong sense of spring arriving. The early crocuses are emerging, the snowdrops are out, and the buds are forming on the trees. The ice storm put us into winter, but in March we'll have one foot solidly into spring and I can't wait to see it. See you in March.